this song and very simply a man who came to faith in a country where it's very difficult to be a Christian um, and then his wife was killed and he himself lost his life and these are some of the words that said that he said um, on that day whenever he lost his own life um, for following Jesus so it just paints it all in a whole new light um, incredible words so. remember the youth special it's from junior youth challenge age right up please remember the youth special thank you Trevor <clears throat> thank you once again lovely to see so many people gathered again tonight and uh, just cannot believe how quickly this mission has gone in and the music I think gets better every night uh, it's just great good music does something for gospel meetings and we're just so grateful for that uh, katie tonight well now we're turning to the book of acts tonight <clears throat> acts chapter 26 acts chapter 26 <clears throat> and we'll start reading at verse 19 acts chapter 26 starting to read at verse 19 <clears throat> Many of you will be reasonably familiar with this passage of Scripture, I'm sure. Uh, this is Paul giving his, uh, Apostle Paul giving his defense before King Agrippa. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me, having therefore obtained help of God. I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, 
but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, and this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be, to be a Christian or to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Amen. We pray for God's blessing upon the, the reading of his word, and we pray that God will just take his word tonight and use it. A wee prayer just uh, before we open up this passage. <clears throat> oh God, our Father, we just praise you for the lovely sense of your presence tonight. We've been singing these beautiful hymns about the cross. O oh Christ, what burdens bow thy head. Our load was laid on thee. We've been brought face to face with Calvary tonight. We thank you that we do stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. We want to praise you tonight that we worship a living Savior. And we thank you tonight that we can honestly sing and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. For many, that's true in this meeting. And Lord, you know exactly who has decided and who's on that road and who's not. But Lord, with the Apostle Paul here addressing Agrippa, we would say we would to God tonight that every single individual listening to this service, whether online or here in person, or perhaps at a later date, we want to pray tonight that all would have decided, that all would have come into that vital, living, close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we pray tonight for salvation blessing. We look to you that you will do your own powerful work in this meeting this evening. We pause to pray for people that are shattered and broken tonight. We pray for the Caldwell family. And ask, Lord, that you would come to that uh, chief inspector tonight lying there in hospital. We pray for your healing touch upon him. We pray for children that were deeply traumatized over the last 24 hours. We pray for people who have been deeply impacted. And, oh God, we pray that as the reality of the situation unfolds and people be are made aware just how quickly we could be cut off. And we ask, Lord, that it might not be the case for John Caldwell. We pray that he will, uh, that you will keep your hand upon him, and we pray that he might fully recover. Lord, intervene, we pray, in our land. And we just look to you, God, for your gracious intervention. But more importantly, divine intervention in the lives of men and women across our, across our land, and in Fintna tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Those of you who have attended gospel missions and are familiar with Christian things will have no doubt had no problem picking out the text as we read through this passage tonight. They are, of course, these wonderful words issued by King Agrippa. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Without going into a lot of de uh, detail here uh, and, and, I, and, and painting a lot of the background, just let me say that the Apostle Paul had given his testimony here. In fact, he used his court case because he really was on trial here. And he took the opportunity, rather than defending himself, he took the opportunity to give his testimony and tell of what the Lord had done for him. If we'd read a little, bit early, a little bit earlier in the chapter, we could, of course, read the account 
of the testimony of Saul of Tarsus. Did you know he was a wicked individual? He was a blasphemer, even though he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, even though he was deep, deeply religious, even though he kept the nth degree of the law, he was a vile sinner. He said himself that he was a blasphemer. He persecuted Christians. He denied the resurrection. He was an evil man. That's in his testimony. But of course, there aren't many people who don't know the phrase, a Damascus Road experience. It's a phrase that's used in common, uh, in, in common English these days. You know, uh, oh well, uh, I, I haven't had a Damascus Road experience. People know what a Damascus Road experience is used in contemporary language. They mean a life that's utterly and totally turned upside down and absolutely transformed. And what transformed Saul of Tarsus and made him the mighty preacher, missionary, uh, evangelist that he became? Of course, it was on that day while he was on that road that God broke into his life. I was reading this passage this morning and preparing this message, and it struck me again. And there came a light from heaven. And I, I read that this morning. I stopped and I prayed, Lord, would you send a light from heaven into the meeting in Finda tonight? Because I tell you, when God sends a light from heaven, God has a wonderful way of sending a shaft of light into the hearts and minds of men and women. Many people struggle with doubts and fears and all sorts of things go through their minds. It's not uncommon. But I tell you, darkness and doubt and the veil, the blindness, the darkness, whatever way you want to express it, when God sends a light from heaven, things are utterly transformed and changed. That's our prayer for this meeting tonight, that God will send a shaft of light and suddenly somebody will see mightily and powerfully the truth of, of, of the gospel. Well, Saul's powerfully converted. And of course, he falls on his knees and he asks the question, who art thou? Who are you? Lord. I believe that that was the moment that Saul was really turned around. When somebody who's a blasphemer can be so broken and so enlightened that he looks into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ because he saw him there on the Damascus road and he addresses Jesus Christ as Lord. Of course, we can say prayers and we can uh, use the name of Jesus and we can say Lord, but it's a different story when you look into his face and you say, who are you? Lord. I believe that was the moment when the, of crisis for Saul of Tarsus, and he was turned uh, right around. It was a powerful, powerful conversion. I remember, remember listening to a sermon one morning in a particular church, and there was a, a wonderful exposition given, uh, uh, an explanation about what conversion was all about, and I was gutted when the minister stopped, just like that, and he never said, and you need to be converted. You need to be transformed and, and changed. Well, I'm not going to make that mistake tonight. We're preaching about Saul's powerful conversion and the testimony that he gave and the impact that it made upon this man, King Agrippa. Now, don't want to talk a lot more about Saul, but we are going to talk about the, as, as he spoke to King Agrippa and the response that he got from this I fairly wicked king too. You know that he was Herod Agrippa. And of course, there are several Herods mentioned in the Bible as at least four. They were nasty people. They were not nice people to know the Herods. He, he it would be his great grandfather, if I could get my history right, maybe his grandfather, I can't remember, that was responsible for the murder of the babies uh, uh, at, the, at the birth of Christ. This is who this individual is. This is Herod Agrippa. And uh, as, as, as Saul, or now the Apostle Paul, gives his testimony, it draws this response from King Agrippa. Almost, you persuade me to be a Christian. He was powerfully impacted. To be a Christian or to become a Christian? Do you know what a Christian is? I'm amazed sometimes preaching in places, and you, you think, well, people know what a Christian is, but I want to spell it out tonight and be absolutely clear about what a Christian is. 
some people think that it's being brought up in a Christian country, brought up in a Christian family, educated in a Christian tradition, uh, connected with a Christian church, maybe a member or an adherent, maybe intending to be buried in a Christian manner, and that makes you a Christian. <laughs> That's not the biblical definition of what a Christian is. You see, a Christian, the Bible makes it absolutely clear. The Bible makes it clear that a Christian is a person who is in Christ. Listen to Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away and all things become new. There's the definition of a Christian, someone who is in Christ. But then the Bible also says the great teaching of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 15, where Jesus spells it out, uh, uh, that not only are we in him, but he is in us. John chapter 15 spells that out very clearly. He talks about the, he, he says, I am the vine, and speaking to his disciples, he says, and you are the branches. So what is a Christian? Let me put it like this. A Christian is someone who is basically a dry, dead, useless twig. That's not very complimentary, is it? Whom God picks up, grafts into the true vine, the very life of the vine gets into that old, dry, dead, useless twig, and we become a branch in the true vine. That's what a Christian is, someone who is in Christ, in Christ. In fact, six or seven times in John chapter 15, we have the phrase, if you abide in me, in me, in me, in me. There's what a Christian really is, and you can study that for, your, your, for, for yourself. You know, you cannot be a Christian without Christ. People think that you can be a Christian without Christ. It's just a matter of following his teaching, trying to uh, uh, emulate the, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you can be a Muslim without Muhammad because he's dead. You can be a, a Buddhist without Buddha because he doesn't exist. But you can't be a Christian without the person of Christ. Christ must live in you. You must live in Christ. It's the very life of the, uh, of the vine that makes the branch alive, and it's the life of Christ in you that makes you spiritually alive. Let's make that absolutely clear about what a Christian really is. Now, I have about six things here that I'm going to try and get through tonight about Agrippa's response. I think Agrippa's response indicates a number of things. First thing, it indicates that Agrippa <coughs> obviously had deep thoughts about God. He had an understanding, or at least some understanding, of the way of salvation. He wasn't totally ignorant about the, 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 the way of salvation and so on. Because you, 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 know, you see, uh, Agrippa says to him, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. So obviously in the dialogue, the apostle Paul has picked up things that indicate that Agrippa He's not actually terribly opposed, even though he was a, a, a horrible man, an immoral man. Uh, he, he, he had an understanding, so he thought deeply about Christian things, about spiritual things. Would that be you? You know, you think about it. Think about Christian things, and you turn it over, and, uh, 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 and so on. Well, the impact of Paul's preaching and teaching and particularly when he gives his testimony to, to Agrippa, it really does impact him. Now, what are the things that Paul says here? Let me pick them out of this chapter, and you can uh, uh, check it for yourself. In verse 20, what does Paul say in his testimony? He says that they should repent. Sorry, give me uh, turn the page here. <coughs> uh, yeah, ver ver verse 20 but showed first unto them at Damascus and Jerusalem, uh, uh, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now, there's two things in that wee phrase. What's Paul telling Agrippa? The first step in becoming a genuine Christian is understanding what repentance is. Now, there's a world of difference between remorse and repentance. You know, there are people, when they do something horrible and terrible things, they're full of remorse. They're full of remorse. They may make apologies. They may outwardly say sorry, and they're full of remorse. And they maybe wouldn't be full of remorse if they hadn't been caught. Repentance is something entirely different. 
Repentance is when somebody, yeah, has remorse, but goes on further to do an about turn and go in the opposite direction. Repentance is not, it's, it's saying, sorry, we're doing it, and it's stopping doing it again. That's what repentance is all about. It's going in the opposite direction. I want to say to you tonight that you cannot be converted without repentance. Why do I say that? Well, the Bible says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. If there's been no repentance and confession of sin, the sins can't be blotted out. So there's no conversion without repentance. That's clear. That's what Paul uh, preached here. Then the second thing he says, that you should uh, uh, do works meet for repentance. I read this in a, in, a, in a paraphrase, and it goes like this, and I quite like it. Do works and live lives consistent with, uh, 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 consistent with and worthy of their repentance. What does that mean? In plain, simple language, there'll be a change in lifestyle. There'll be a complete change. You know, we cannot follow the world and live in sin and claim to have belonged to Jesus and claim to be a, a, a claim that he has come into our lives. When he comes into our hearts and lives and we're in him and we receive his life, then there's a change. So there we have it. Number one, the necessity of repentance and the change of uh, 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 lifestyle. Then he goes on in the third place. You'll see it here in the chapter uh, in verse 23. Paul says that Christ should suffer. By the way, if you're giving your testimony, never miss the two core elements of the gospel. In all your witnessing, always introduce the two core elements of the gospel. What are they? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. If we miss out the death and the resurrection of Christ in our preaching and our witness and talking to people, we're not bringing them the gospel. That's the core, the, core mess the two core messages of the gospel. And so these two uh, elements of the gospel, the Apostle Paul, he makes sure that Agrippa understands it. In fact, Paul, of course, spelt it out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. What did he say? The, me the message of the cross is foolishness. Eh? Foolishness to those who are uh, 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 foolishness to those who are preaching, uh, perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God, the message of the cross. It's the power of God. Thank you, Katie, for singing tonight about the cross. We're never tired about the cross if we don't sing about the cross and bring the message of the cross before people. You, they'll never be saved, and you'll never be saved. You'll never be saved. You'll never be in the kingdom of God. You'll never know deliverance from sin. You'll never know God, God's amazing power and glory in your life until there's been repentance and there's a, 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 a getting hold of the message of the cross. And not only the message of the cross, but the message of the resurrection. He's alive. Up from the grave. So glad we sang that in the mission last night. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. See what Agrippa was getting. Uh, 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 what Agrippa was listening to. As Paul gave his testimony. Agrippa, you need to repent. Agrippa, that lifestyle that you have. If you're going to be saved. If you're going to become a Christian, that lifestyle will have to change. Agrippa, you need to embrace the truth of the cross. Agrippa, you need to understand. You need to understand that confessing Christ, that he is a, 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 a confessing the resurrection. What did Paul go on to say in Romans 10 and 9? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what will happen? You will be saved. Do we grasp it tonight? The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. We can't have one without the other. The death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, Agrippa, I think he was pummeled by it. I think, as, as uh, Paul gave us testimony, it deeply impacted this man. Well, there was not only the deep thought. Secondly, 
My second point here is that Agrippa demonstrated, manifested a tenderness of heart. There was a tenderness of heart. You see, Agrippa could have growled along with Festus. He could have growled at, uh, at, at the Apostle Paul. He could have called the guards and said, get this raven idiot out of here. Well, he, he was accused of that anyway. But Festus said to the Apostle Paul, Paul, much learning uh, is, uh, well, it says make you mad. It's driving you crazy. And of course, the Apostle Paul goes back to him and he says, I am not mad. I'm not a nutcase. I'm not a nutcase. He was quite clear. He was quite seen. He was very definite that he wasn't crazy in any one way or another. And here's, here's Agrippa now being moved. This man isn't raving. This man's on the mark. And it softened his hard heart. Do you know how the Bible describes hard-hearted people? The Bible talks about, and in, in the, in the prophecy of Ezekiel, and God promises to take away the stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. Eh? Stony hearts? Hearts like flint? You know what stony hearts are? It's cold. You ever meet somebody like that? It's cold as ice. Poo. What's a chill, don't you? You meet somebody and you think, oh, I'm not going to get far here in a conversation. They're cold, they're impenetrable, they're stubborn. And I'll tell you something about a cold heart. They're unrepentant. They can say things, they can do things, they can cut you in two, and they wouldn't bat an eyelid. That's the cold heart. But God says, I will take away the stony heart. Eh? There's no heart surgeon can do that. There's no medical procedure that can deal with hard hearts. I give people a new, by the way, you know what the heart is? You know, you heard about the atheist. You know, the pre preacher was standing and talking about the sinful heart and, the, and so on, and your heart needs to be changed. And he was accusing the preacher of, uh, he, said, he shouted at him and he said, you know, your heart, your heart been sinful? He says, the heart's only a, a piece of muscle that pumps the blood around your body. And the quick well preacher very quickly went, uh, went back to him. Okay, he said, you go home and tell your wife, I love you with all my pump. He got the message. You know what the heart is? It's the real you. The real you. The heart that perhaps needs to be softened up. And Agrippa's heart was without doubt. This tough character, the Agrippas weren't known to be soft-hearted or the, the heritage, rather, weren't known to be soft-hearted. God has a wonderful way of softening hearts. We've come across people who've had hard, hard, hard hearts. And God has an amazing way of softening hearts. God can bring things into our lives, circumstances. I would be very careful about saying that God brings tragedies into people's lives. But I'll say this, God can use tragedies to soften hearts. God can use some circumstances, circumstances that none of us would ever choose. But God performs heart surgery. He takes away the stony heart. How does God do this? Well, three things. Three things under this tenderness of heart. This man demonstrated something of a, a, of a, a conviction of sin. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is described in John 16, verses 8 to 11. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, you know about the work of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity? Boy, when he begins to work, what does he do? He convicts of sin. He convicts of, uh, of righteousness and of judgment. There's three things. Let me deal with them quickly. Number one, conviction of sin. And what's the greatest sin? What's the greatest sin? Yeah, murder is a heinous sin. Immorality is a heinous sin. All of those things. Would it shock you tonight if I told you that the greatest sin you can commit is to keep Jesus Christ out of your life? Huh? I did a mission in the parish of Drumcree. You ever heard of Drumcree? Eh? <laughs> Infamous Drumcree. I remember going to the parish church on a Sunday morning 
because of the kindness of the old canon who was there. And he preached that Sunday morning. Boy, it was a wee pulpit, very small wee pulpit, and he was uh, almost tied up on the thing. And he looked down across the congregation. I think he'd been inspired by the mission and so on that was going on at that time. And he literally jumped. And he said this to his congregation. He said, listen, you people, and pointed the finger. The greatest sin you people can commit is to keep Jesus Christ outside of your lives. You say you believe, but you've never invited Christ in. You're committing the sin of unbelief. Ooh, boy, it cut through that morning. I trust it cuts through tonight. To keep Christ outside of your life is the greatest sin you can commit. You say, where do you get the, 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 the scripture for that? He who does not believe is condemned already. There's a condemnation that rests upon us because of our refusal to embrace Christ. He who does not believe the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. There we have it. The sin of unbelief, keeping Christ out. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit makes us miserable. He convicts us of our sin, and the sin being keeping Jesus outside the door. And then the, 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 the second part, convict of righteousness. That's a little bit hard just to get your head around, but what, what, what uh, the, that, that passage of Scripture John is teaching, uh, it's, it's to teach us and show us our total inability to demonstrate any righteousness, anything that would be acceptable to God of righteousness. What is it, what's the Holy Spirit show us? The Holy Spirit will show us that every single bit of our self-righteousness, do you know what it is? I said it the other night. It's a dirty rag. A dirty rag. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of our filthy self-righteousness and shows us what? That Christ perfectly fulfilled the law. That Christ took our sin upon his cross, uh, upon the cross, and he will take these dirty, filthy rags of our sin from us. And he'd cleanse us and he'd exchange that for a beautiful robe. It's called the robe of righteousness. You know about the, the story of the prodigal when he came home? You know what the, the father, the, the broken-hearted father, instead of thrashing the boy, what did he do? He sent his servant, go and bring the best robe and put it on him. I tell you, that moves my heart every time I read it. Bring the best robe and put it, put it on him. And those of us tonight that have walked away from God, turned our backs on God and kept Christ out, here's the message, the sweet, sweet message of the gospel. He'll take your dirty rags and he'll give you that beautiful robe of righteousness. The Spirit of God shows us that, of, righteous, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. What's that? The Spirit of God shows us, and it was happening to Agrippa, that there's a day of judgment coming. It is appointed. He is appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. And of course, it's by that man whom he has appointed, Jesus Christ, the judge. Listen, there's a day of judgment coming. We'll have to stand. Well, if we're unconverted, if we're unsaved, and we die without Christ, we'll face the judgment, a dreadful judgment, and hear him say to us, depart from me. I never knew you. And we'll be banished and lost forever. Well, I'm going to move on from that because I, I, my time is going to beat me all together tonight. The tenderness of heart. The third thing about Agrippa and his statement here, it indicated that he was just one tiny step, one small step from, uh, from conversion. Reverend Park preached the other night on that text uh, 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 about the man in, in Mark 12 and 34. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And here's this King Agrippa. It could have been said of him that he wasn't far from the kingdom of God. Do you know that in the Song of Solomon, there's a very interesting little phrase. I wonder do you know it? It says, the little foxes spoil the vines. Huh? Do you know what that means? The little foxes 
spoil the vines. It means it's the small things that can create havoc and ruin. Eh? A tiny invisible bug brought our world to a standstill for two or three years. It's called COVID-19, <laughs> the little things. And sometimes when it comes to salvation in the kingdom of God, it's the little things, the little things, apparently not that significant that pe keep people from taking that step. Let me identify some of the barriers that perhaps uh, 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 stop people, maybe stop you from getting into the kingdom of God. Number one, pride. Pride. Maybe not, doesn't manifest itself that much. But Agrippa, that was certainly true of him. Because we read about Agrippa that he loved pomp. He loved show. He loved to be seen. And without doubt, one of the barriers in Agrippa's life was pride. Our reputation. What would somebody say if they heard I had got saved? I have turned around and I have now committed my life to Jesus Christ. And you're immediately thinking, oh, there's that boy. Oh, and I know what sort of a mockery would be if I told him I'd become a Christian. And our pride won't let us turn around. Second thing is self-righteousness. I've already dealt with that. You know, to kneel at the cross. We sang that, or we had that song here the other night, kneel at the cross. To kneel at the cross of Christ, it hits at the very core of self-righteousness. Eh? You know, I, I'm going to do my best. You know, I, I can manage. I, I, I live a good life. For me to kneel at a cross, to think that a man crucified on a cross, shedding his blood, that that's the only way to heaven, I'll tell you, that deals with all the old dirty rags of self-righteousness. And when we look up and recognize what Christ has done for us, it hits at the pride. It deals with the self-righteousness. There's another one. And there's too much of it in Northern Ireland. I spent a good number of years in England. So I, I, I'm in a position where I can compare a little bit. There's an unwillingness to forgive. I don't know how you feel when you hear somebody that has faced deep trauma, whether it's the Enniskillen bombing or whatever of the terrible, terrible events that have happened, whether it's, whatever it might be. And of course, the, the, the journalists like to draw this out and get people to express their opinions and so on. How do you feel about them? I've watched some people and I've prayed for them because I felt terribly sorry for them. They've said, I'll never forgive. I'll never forgive. And I'll tell you what that is. That's like Putin injecting somebody with poison that will eventually kill them. A lack of forgiveness. Now, listen, I'm not standing here saying tonight that forgiveness is easy. But forgiveness becomes a lot easier when you realize he forgave me. I'm forgiven. He forgive us our, what do we pray in the, the Lord's Prayer? As we forgive, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others. And there are people tonight who may be professing to be a Christian, maybe wanting to be a Christian, would love to be, have the assurance of being saved. But there's something in there. There's something in there. And they just will not let it go. They just can't let it go. There's a, there's a bitterness. There's a depth of something. And they find it hard. I'm not saying to you tonight that it's easy to let it go. But oh, the abundance of his grace. The wonder of his mercy toward us. How he pours out his grace upon us. And it's only by his grace, because of his mercy, and, the, and because of his grace, that we can forgive. If there's an unwillingness tonight 
a non-willingness to forgive and to, to, I don't like the phrase, but you know what it means, bury the hatchet. Bury the hatchet. Deal with it if we're going to get across the line. Misunderstanding. Misunderstanding what? Well, there have been a lot of people that have, I've heard them say, counselling people over the years, over many years of evangelistic work, you know, I'd love to be saved, but you know, I couldn't keep it. I couldn't keep it. And I've learned over years as well to say to people when they make that response, you know what, you're dead right. Because there's no way to keep. We've got it wrong. Totally wrong. I couldn't keep it. What's the it? God's mighty saving grace. We don't keep it. God keeps us. Eh? I love Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we say we couldn't keep it. Salvation, it's the power of God. It's not, it's not you that keeps it. Oh, the wonder of it. Paul or Peter uses the phrase, kept by the power of God. You'll have no problem. You'll have no problem following the Lord. You'll have no problem walking with God as you yield yourself to him and surrender to him. You'll have a problem if you don't yield because you'll have nothing to keep. But I tell you, when you yield to him, he does the keeping. He'll take you through the trials and the difficulties. He'll put you on the road and he'll keep you on the road and give you grace to walk with him. Misunderstanding, couldn't keep it. And then there's another lie that's particularly popular that the devil pumps out. Uh, God will spoil your life. That is a lie from the pit. God will spoil your life. You know what the devil does? He contradicts what Jesus says. Jesus says, I've come to bring you life and to give it to you more abundantly, more abundantly. I read on social media or on some website or something today, flicking through the news, and an account of a, a, a lassie that was buried there recently in Belfast, a drug addict, Crown Jesus Ministries, and some other people as well had tried to help her. She had been helping drug addicts. She herself became a drug, a drug addict. And she tragically, tragically died out of that drug addiction. Hey, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Listen, it's, an, it's, it's a lie from the, 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 the devil. Well, there's some other stuff here. Here's the one that probably keeps many back. It's fear of what others would say. I've touched on that already. But again, the scripture says the fear of man the fear of somebody, what they'll say, it brings a snare. You know what a snare is? We're not allowed to use snares now, are we? Can't snare a rabbit anymore. And you know what a snare is? I better not tell you how to make one. <laughs> You'll think, I don't really know how to make a snare, but I've, I've seen one. The wire is put in a certain way that when the rabbit gets its foot into it, as soon as it gives a pull, the wire tightens. Okay? And it trips them up. It halts their progress. The fear of man brings a snare. It, the fear of what people would say if you become a Christian, it'll just paralyze you. It'll just bring you right down and you'll stop dead in your tracks. Number seven, and I'm nearly through, uh, involvement, a wrong relationship. Involvement in whatever, and there's a wrong relationship. It doesn't tell us here about Bernice. We would sort of assume that Bernice in this passage of Scripture here was Agrippa's wife. She was a female. But she wasn't his wife. Now, I, I uh, hadn't time today to research it any further. But I think she may have been his niece, and, but he was living with her. He was in an immoral relationship. And because there was a wrong relationship, that was what held sin was a big issue. That's what stopped Agrippa getting over the line. Oh, he said almost. You know, he, he had all the bits and pieces in place. His heart had been softened. He, he knew what he needed to do. It got light. Uh, understanding had come to him. 
But sin is the big barrier. Repentance must take place. Very quickly, moving on from the tiny steps to the tragedy of almost. Bunyan and in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, it's not long since I dipped into it. I can't say I ever read it fully. But uh, he sees in that uh, allegory, that, that, that story, that even from the very gate of heaven, there was a way down to hell. To be at the very gate, to be just almost there, there was a way all the way back and down to hell itself. The tragedy of almost. I could enumerate several illustrations of this truth from the, from the Scriptures. Think of the two thieves, one on either side of Christ. The cross was in the middle, one thief who derided Christ, and the other who accepted Christ. They were the equal distance from Christ. And where did one go? The man who repented. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Where did the other one go? He mocked Christ. And there's not a doubt that that man was lost. He, he perished. He was the same distance, same distance as the man who repented. There's what made the difference. Uh, the Reverend Park spoke about, uh, uh, about uh, Abner the other night. I often preach in Abner. I think I preached in Abner in the Oma Mission. The man who died one step from safety in King David wept at his funeral and he said, died Abner as a fool dieth. Your hands weren't bound, your feet weren't put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. One step from safety. Oh, the tragedy, the tragedy of almost. Let me just sum this up by saying this. Almost. To be almost saved is to see your need and not confess it. Almost is to desire to be saved and remain undecided. Undecided. I think I said the first night of the mission. You don't remain undecided. There's a sense in which you don't. Because you've decided not to decide. Boy, there are a lot of folk in that position. They've decided not to decide. They remain undecided for Christ. It's to be at the door, but still outside. It's to be convicted and convinced of the rightness of the decision and put it off until another time. Almost. It's procrastination. We can talk about Felix. I'm not going to because the time's gone. Felix said, when I have a more convenient time. Do, do you know why Felix procrastinated? And he said, I'll come, back, I'll, I'll, I'll come back at a more convenient time. Do you know what the discussion was about? Do you know why? Because there was issues of self-control, righteousness, and judgment to come. Ooh, he just withdrew it. You know, have you ever been in a debate and a discussion with somebody, and you know when you, you know when you've thrown the hand grenade, you've you've pulled the pin in the discussion, and somebody just they, they recoil, they jump back. Ooh, can't go there. That was what uh, Felix did. I can't go there. Another time. Another time. There's example after example in the scriptures of people who were almost there. Almost. Tell me, is it going to be almost or altogether? Finish with this one. We have the triumph of altogether. Don't you love the writings of the Apostle Paul? We, uh, you know, Paul was a, 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 he was a church planter. He was a pastor. He was a theologian. He was a teacher, but at his heart, he was an evangelist. You say, why, why do you say that? Because he says, I would to God. Do you feel his heart? I would to God that you, uh, all those that are here, were both, I would to God that you were both almost and, what's the word? Altogether persuaded. Altogether persuaded. And of course, Paul expresses that when he writes to young Timothy. I know whom I have believed and am what? I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. To be almost is to be lost. 
to be almost is to be lost. I wonder tonight as the Spirit of God bringing this powerfully to your heart and to your soul tonight. And you have said, I've been so close so many times. Oh, I remember five years ago, I remember a time, I remember a service, I remember this, I remember that. I was almost there. I remember hearing Dr. Andrew Woolsey years ago, he preached about the sheep getting into the fold. You know, can you get the picture of the sheepfold? And the old sheepfold was a stone wall, of course, covered with whitewash. And he looked at his congregation and he said to them, there's a lot of you tonight and you're covered with whitewash. You're rubbing up against the fold, but you're not in it. The whitewash is on you, but you're not inside the fold. Outside the, outside, yeah, the whitewash indicated that they were very close to the fold, but they weren't in the fold. Listen, I'm just going to finish with a couple of scriptures. And I, 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 I prayed over these three verses as I wrote them down today to, to bring this message to a close. Here it is. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I was reading about the children of Israel, the rebellion. They could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. There's the big sin, unbelief. The other scriptures were these. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. This is a day of opportunity. This is the time. Jeremiah 29, 13. You shall seek me and find me when you search. Search. Seek. Search. And the last scripture is strive. Are you with me? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Search for him with all your heart. Strive to enter in. You're at the gate. Shake the whitewash off. Don't let it uh, distract you. Get inside the gate into the family and fold of God. Almost. The hymn says, I suspect, and Brother Mel sing it now. Almost is but to fail. Almost is to be lost. Seek, search, strive to enter in. We pray, Lord, we pray that you will graciously apply your word by your Holy Spirit. Lord, send light. Bring release. Do your work in hearts tonight. Lord, we plead, like the apostle said, I would to God. Lord, that's our prayer tonight. We would to God. And men and women would be saved. Granted, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for listening to this mission message. It may be that this message has deeply challenged your heart concerning your need of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is so, please contact us for help and prayer and literature using the information that will now appear on the screen. It'll be our privilege to help you in any way that we possibly can. God bless you. Your friend in Christ's service, Pastor Paul Johnston of Fintanet Independent Methodist Church.